that was performed in the Lake Arbor Creek. Battle of Los Angeles, 1942. There were at least two retreat there, so now we're at three. If we consider this case in 1942, now we're at four before Roswell. Now we talk, the body count starts getting higher. Uh, this is 1942 at a base north of Georgia. I don't know where it is, neither did the wonder. He didn't even know. It was somewhere north of Georgia. This thing was 15 feet in diameter, 10 feet high. There were four BT bodies taken alive. They later died. Uh, this thing had three levels. The upper deck had a control panel with buttons and switches and a display. Below that was the mid deck, which had a cutout in the center so that these beams could walk in. And on this mid deck, there were four what looked like bar stools that were parked and sat behind a wraparound window with two smaller windows flanked on either side of the main. Now, the bottom deck was the entryway hatchway. So, this is Leonard Stringfield, page 319, where you can get the reference for this thing. These beams were about five feet tall. 90 pounds, large black eyes, so we've got oversized head, oversized eyes, slip for a mouth, minute nose, milky white skin, and emaciated body parts, hands and arms that went down below the knees. That's what we're looking at here. And this is what these witnesses are telling us. Were they alive? Or were they alive? Really interesting. Um, so north of Georgia, this craft, this is, this is pre-Roswell. Pre-Roswell. I mean, I know there's right. been a few of them, but yeah, you know, there, there, there's okay. So like, the crashes really picked up around Roswell, and it makes sense that there would have been crashes before that because of the whole radar thing. Um, now, like when you get 1930s and earlier, I don't think so much. You know, may, there have been some reports, like I think there was an Aurora, Texas crash that maybe happened in the 1800s, late 1800s, 1890s. Someone forgot the bolt, right? Someone forgot the bolt on that ship and it just like lost a wheel. You get to the like 1940s and on, and like, why are there so many UFO crashes? Well, it's the radar thing. It's the, the humans figuring out how to take them down. This craft now that we just saw, and you've got a bunch of, of curious <clears throat> military personnel want to break into this thing. Apparently, John, according to Shrat, diamond drills didn't even make a dent on some of those crap. Yeah, what's this stuff made out of? Crazy, right? And engineered to be denser, harder, like resistant to the sharpest thing on our planet. That's crazy. Also, some of it's reported to be, what, self-healing? Yeah, right. And, and you know, you and I have been bringing up self-healing metal quite a bit, or even concrete. Like, we found some uh, evidence of self-healing concrete, like the, uh, the Coliseum even has some of this technology in there that we don't understand now, many, many years later, right? Um, so, yes, yeah, very, very interesting stuff. Well, that also makes me, you know, we ran across that article the other day on the Debrief website that's talking about how scientists just came up with a self-healing metal. And I'm like, no, man, this was, this was absolutely fed into industry, fed to the scientists. Well, and, and why aren't they telling us when they reverse engineered something? Like, just, just right. be honest, honest about it. You probably found metal somewhere from either a previous civilization or from one of these craft, somebody's reversed engineered it, figured out how to do it, and then they write an article as if science is so great and grand that they did it themselves. Right, well humans are the end all be all. That's like, I don't know, it's just what- we. Oh, we, we love telling ourselves that, that's for sure. Right. Yeah. This is crazy. That's too, that is, so this was uh, the healing stone um, that they kind of unraveled recently. We can see 2,000 years old on the left and 20 years old on the right, which is totally rotted. Yeah, so here's that article. Self-healing metal discovery opens door for giant tech leap. And this is on earth.com if you want to check out that, that article about self-healing metal. We pulled this up on uh, Edge of Wonder a couple weeks ago or a week ago or something like that. Okay, so, you know, Schratz kind of asked here whether or not, or he's, he's at least discussing what he thinks about these people. You know, 
does he think they're lying? And he says, I don't think that these that all these guys are lying because they say the same thing. I keep getting these reports from these military witnesses of not only diamond tip drill bits, but torches and lasers trying to get into these crafts. One said that they shot a laser at this thing and it bounced and then destroyed a bunch of the you know the warehouse or that whatever the the, the hangar that they were in. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, I mean, someone's going to take their eye out if they don't stop this nonsense. You're not going to get in. Well, and I think it's a lot more than an eye jump. I think, like, if, if Tucker Carlson's information is true, that we've got some of these, you know, we've got a bunch of lawsuits going on right now from people that have been hurt or killed by some of these UFO crafts. Well, well there's got to be a lot that we haven't even heard about in history. I mean, think about all of the damage that's occurred. Oh, I'm, I know. Can you imagine? I mean, look, how many has Shrat cataloged? Uh, hundreds? Yeah. What, what was it? And he's gone through 50,000 I mean, of these files. <laughs> 50,000 files? Sorry. I mean, it's like, wow. Wow. I mean, think about how many they've actually gotten. Yeah, how many they've actually gotten. And so that is, now you got to wonder out of that percentage, how many have they actually been able to get into? It's probably a lot less. Than that. Well, so what? So what he was saying in the interview was really interesting. You guys, definitely you should go check this interview out if you, have, if you haven't. Like, there's so many more stories than we're bringing up here. They were doing ev anything and everything possible to figure out how to get into these things, and I think eventually they even used liquid nitrogen, like dipped the entire thing into liquid nitrogen, took it out, and it got like, of course, it's nitrogen, right? So things got more frail, and then they were able to get in. In some cases, not all. Big question really is like, why would they be trying to get into the craft if they were ours? So there's a lot of people out there listening to this that are like, well, these are our crafts. We are whatever. Well. Why would they be trying to get into these or break into these, like he's claiming? Like so many of these whistleblowers have claimed. Why are all these people dying from getting close to UFOs if they're our own? Like, when humans make something safe enough to get close to it, they have to fly in them. I don't understand here, like like the whole you know Pentagon releasing Tic Tac videos and whatnot, because here you are presenting something about a very high technology and then raising the question of, we don't know. We don't know what this is. And then pull back on the alien question and go, oh, no, I it's alien. But we don't know what this is. You are literally just stoking the fires of aliens. Okay, you literally yeah. are. Yeah, I agree with you. First of all, I agree with you. However, when we're talking about, the, for lack of a better way to say it, the mother load of disclosure and, and technologies and all of that stuff. The Tic Tac UFO video is a very conveniently organized release to keep the information only going so far. Where you've got right. like, yeah, you've got like a, yeah, you've got a mountain of information and you're showing them the tip of a tiny iceberg and just letting people talk about that instead of all of this other stuff right so to me that that actually really makes sense like why show people that well it's because it's either that or people start talking about some of these other things like mike schratz 50,000 files or who knows what else you know yeah, right, right. A little smoke. Pretty interesting story here. There was a six-year-old whose electrician father worked at the base at Wright Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. So this is Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. During the lunch break, when he was visiting, a, this is the little boy, I assume, a janitor offered the kid a soda. And as he's getting the soda, a door opened and he got a quick peek inside. He saw two tractor trailer trucks with various trucks covered in tarps. <clears throat> there was a disc shaped craft with triangular landing gear. Three ET bodies lying on the ground, 20 feet in diameter. So this is 20 feet in diameter two raised surfaces around the outside of the craft. The boy saw the bodies in 1946. I just brought down the enemy network. And here are the 3D renderings, actually we've got, so these are 3D renderings of exactly what it looked like in that interview on Rise. So you can actually see those 3D renderings there. That's crazy, look at that. Yeah. 
How would you get that there with those trucks? Like, you, like they covered them up with those tarps and then they 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 flew them, or sorry, they drove them all the way up to Ohio. This is why yeah, Ohio exactly. is so weird, everybody. Yeah, I you know they we've looked at a lot of crashes with remote viewing and I I can say that thematically it's kind of all from Roswell, Kecksburg. Kecksburg has some like really weird aspect to it though as well. Um, whatever UFO crash it is, even back to Mussolini and that crash and like actually that was the nineteen thirties, I think. <clears throat> that happened before World War II. I did an episode on Rise TV where uh, it's called Crashes of the Visitors. And I I go down this path of like, I didn't even really talk about Roswell, which is the most well-known crash, because not only have other remote viewers covered it extensively, um, we found the same thing they found. It's also kind of boring, right? It's also kind of boring after a while. While it may be amazing to some people, there's actually not a whole ton of information that you're going to get out of it that's any different than what the witnesses have already described, right? Well, yeah, it crashed. Yeah, this really, truly happened, according to the data. Some of them are interesting, but most of them are just kind of like, okay, yeah, it was just another UFO crash. They got the bodies, they got the crap. Um, it's gonna happen again because they are taking them down with a, a radar type of pulse. It's a little bit more sophisticated now, but, and it's more directed, you know? <laughs> so we look at weirder stuff. Right? It's like, okay, yeah. so what about the ones where, where a, a scientist walks into a ship and he starts puking everywhere because there's a dimensional anomaly in it and outside it looked like it was 100 feet long you go inside it's like three football fields right and that kind of stuff is actually interesting that's interesting though yeah that that he got that sick maybe it was you know most of that make the, those mechanics are in your in your ear in your eardrums yeah. So if those get whack, out of whack, you can start throwing up right away. I mean, this is what happens to people on ships and airplanes and stuff over time. It's... Right, right. Yeah. Well, it's like a weird thing. I mean, we've seen this in other projects that, that where there's alien type technology around. It, sometimes it's like, like it feels like you are, when you're viewing this stuff, like, like moving, you can tell when you're moving through, through a dimensional space what you're viewing is the viewing through one three-dimensional change in space. So if a being is coming from a higher dimensional realm, has more dimensions in it, and coming into ours, it's as though like they're trying to squeeze their head through a mayonnaise jar or into a mayonnaise jar. Like if you can imagine trying to squeeze your head into a mayonnaise jar, that's a good metaphor for what happens to higher dimensional beings when they come in this room. And it's a discombobulating thing. And going now going into a different or higher dimensional realm from here, it opens up into a bigger space, much, much bigger space than what we perceive in our 3D reality. And it messes with the brain because the brain can't handle it. Oh, that's interesting. Just like the, it's kind of like when you're in a VR headset or whatever, and you're still, but everything in the VR headset is moving like you're moving through a building. Your body gets thrown for a huge loop. Right. You know? Right. You're right. like, everything in you is like, what? Uh, like you feel like you're moving or something. Like right. <laughs> anyway, you guys, this Mike Stratt interview, there's more stories in the Rise TV um, interview with Michael Stratt. Definitely recommend you go check it out. You'll be supporting John and my work. So some of the stories you'll get on that interview are things like a retrieval on the edge of Mexico, worked on both by, uh, by the U.S. and Mexican personnel. So there was competition between countries and collaboration as well. Very interesting. Um, an egg-shaped shaped craft with a mysterious sphere inside. Uh, craft that had a, uh, experienced internal evidence, which sounds like that Titan thing. The thing that happened. It's weird. I mean, think about it. Like water and space. You know? Okay, so close encounters style ships with windows all around it. So those close encounter ships like this one. Um, bodies being recovered 
air hangars that still exist today so large that they have their own weather inside. That's that is crazy. That's crazy. And then classified materials exposed for the first time by Schratz source Leonard Stringfield. That's so much more on those interviews, so definitely go check those out, you guys. Right. right. But now we gotta get into what John and his team are both you here regarding all of this stuff with Mike Schratt. And the first thing we're gonna hit, I think, is Mussolini. So Yeah, the was... Mussolini thing was kind of interesting. Um yeah. So before you get into this, tell everyone what what Schratt's claims were about Mussolini, just to remind everyone. So I think I, it was in the 1930s, before World War II had begun. Mussolini and Italy was on good terms with the Vatican. Uh, and so this actually comes through the Vatican. The Vatican had apparently told the U.S. later on that they became a bit more suspect of Mussolini and Italy for siding with Germany. Uh, but this is before they had sighted with Germany. <clears throat> so they had found a, uh, a crash ship. I think witnesses to the crash as well. And they went to the site and they had found um, what they claimed was a UFO. Actually, when they took it, they didn't know what it was and they thought it was probably mostly terrestrial origin. Um, but the story is that Mussolini had three of these creatures like sitting in his office with him that they recovered from the crash. Just right? chilling there, rotting. Just chilling there. And and the stories are that they were sort of large, four-headed, blonde, Nordic type alien. Oh. Uh, that could be a little bit of propaganda-ish stuff. I don't know for sure. We didn't see necessarily what they were when we looked at this. But what we did see was that the craft was of, like, it was the shape of a wing, but with a central, it, it looked, it wasn't an airplane, but it, it could be misconstrued as like a jet airplane, the way it was shaped. It was more of like, of a wing, a giant wing, than anything else. That's what it looked like. That's what our data is described. This particular ship, what it looks like it was, what it look like, looks like it was for though, was for, put there, crashed there in a sense for just giving some technology away. And it wasn't anything that was super duper um, exotic. It was something that humans at that time could understand. So what it is, literally, now I don't know what the technology is. It's probably something to do with jet engines. But what I think that this craft ultimately did was not necessarily anti-gravity. There could have been some aspects. And I think that it was basically left, left for them in this show kind of situation. Because, you know, we don't, we don't get anything like um, it was shot down or anything like that. It was, there was nothing like that going on. Literally like crash landed, but as somewhat, like we get the word gift showing up in the sessions. Italians had come, had, had developed um, the jet engine mm. earlier than others. So my guess is that this thing had to do with that specifically. It was, it was some type of jet engine. Now, some people think that it was Germany that crashed there with their experiments in jet engines back in 1933. But no, it was nothing like that that we saw. But that would solve a, that would, you know, solve the issue, right? As far as like, and, and, then, and then the reason why Mussolini joined the Germans is because he knew they had superior technology back in 1933. And he's like, you know, they're gonna take over the books. So that's like the whole story that's out there. We don't necessarily get that. Very interesting. So the Mussolini thing is legit. Did you did you see whether or not he had these aliens in his office or no, anything? No, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't see. We, I I don't think that's true. I don't necessarily think that's true. They could have passed through there, but I don't think he was like smoking cigars with dead aliens. Which you know, which would make for a better story, to be honest. It would. Yeah. So the Vatican told the United States about this later on, and the United States came in and confiscated it. What we find, like across the board with UFO crashes, is that they are pretty much all real. 
they're pretty much all real events. Yeah, like 90 to 98 percent of them, right? Right, right. Because there's more around it than just